Mike Gill, State of Corruption. You know what we're going to do? We're going to step you through an attempted murder of me and the police cover it up. No question. I've got evidence now from the jail. And trust me, it wasn't easy. We had to clip a mole to get it. All right. Are you ready? The Bedford Police Department just sent us a letter on the 29th. What we did, we sent them a 91A. We had a secret meeting with Sergeant Mahoney and an asshole named Skip. And in this secret meeting, we gave them certain evidence and people that we had to give us more evidence. You know what they did? They gave it to the plaintiffs. No, we don't have to guess at that. In fact, we put a small clip from, from court that had Steve Gordon saying that we had it. And Tim McLaughlin. So Shaheen and Gordon got the information from the secret meeting with the Bedford Police Department. In fact, they're saying we can't have a copy of that tape because they're still investigating. Wow, there's a good, here's, a, here's an idea. When you're going to do investigating, don't tell the criminals what you got. Bring it in this case, and then you've got the very clear evidence of civil conspiracy, which is not bifurcatable. And I will represent to you, Your Honor, since we filed the motion to amend, Mr. Day and Mr. Gill have engaged in continuing course of conduct together, uh, going to the Secretary of State's office, going to the Bedford Police Department, going to hold rallies where they make the same defamatory statements, Your Honor. Right? But we're not done. The Plastow Police Department? Now, we only got Ryan Toomey embezzling from the company. He only took $38,000 to put down on his house. He's only furnished their house with the company's credit card. Right. But Dorothy McGowan just said, oh, no, no, we don't believe. It's statements, you pinhead. You know why they have to let go of Brian and Carrie? Because they're involved in three murders attempts. They're involved in corrupting up these cases. Right? Question? Brian Toomey, his phone, when we grabbed it, had 15,000 text messages to unknown. Right. In six months. During my meetings with him, he was texting Walker and Bill Shaheen. Right. They were controlling this. We'll post it too. They were involved, which is why the police have to let them go. You don't think about, let's take a look at what happened when I said that we caught Carrie. We also had forensically got her email. So we had McGowan, Officer McGowan, communicating with Carrie. And then giving instructions to Carrie, ready, to destroy text messages. If you have anything to worry about, delete this. He told Tammy pretty much, he told me he was reaching out anymore. Meaning, let me go on. I need a huge favor. I'll call you tonight to explain. This is uh, Carrie calling Christy, the receptionist. I know you tend to hold on to text messages so you can read them later. Can you delete them all? All our old messages back and forth. Like I said, I'll explain tonight. This is Carrie talking to Christy and Brian from talking to the detective from the Plastow Police Department. This detective's giving them the instructions on destroying the evidence that I was asking her to look for. Right. And it's on emails back and forth from Carrie. Ah, you're scaring me. But they're gone now. Delete everything. You see what's happened? But Gowan told Carrie. Carrie turns around and tells Brian and Christy and they destroy these text messages. You've seen how many text messages. There's 15,000 of them. They deleted the evidence. They attempted murder. The communications with Bill Shaheen and Alex Walker. That's what this means. Brian Trumi's been a mole for years and he controlled Carrie Lemieux to the point where they had an affair. Right. That he could get her to do anything they wanted. And she did. She was only my paralegal. Now, we question this murder attempt, right? For instance, in prison. 
I've got my medical records now. The same records that they didn't want to give us. Right. Let's turn around and look at something. Let me give you that 10 day stay. And I want you to remember, I went there because I had evidence, two set of evidence on threatening to murder my children. One was pretty descriptive about cutting their heads off and mailing them to me. But they don't want to see that. And when I insisted is when I went to jail. Okay. Now, you'll see and I'll post this. They took my blood pressure five times in 30 hours. Wow, so concerned. I'm touched. And you know what? 146.88, 160.90, 160.100, 160.90, 160.100, 160.90, 160.90. Right? High blood pressure. But then I had a meeting on the second day. Five times in the first day. You tell me the last time someone was that concerned that they took your blood pressure. Now, it's high, but it's not like I'm going to drop dead. Not that I thought. So then I had a meeting with a Jared Broderick. A lawyer. Wow, a lawyer come to help me on day two? Now, I've already had five blood pressure taken. And this, what they called me out out of the cell and said, you have an attorney here. I go, really? I got an attorney? <laughs> this should be good. And his name's Dave Carney. <clears throat> now, Dave Carney was an attorney that was a friend of mine years ago. Right. So they knew that if they gave me that name, I'd come out and see this person. Well, it turns out it wasn't Dave. It was Jared Broderick. And you know what Jared told me? Take the deal. Take the deal? Yeah. Travel the world. He was representing them, telling me to take the deal. And you know what? I told him to go to hell. And then it hit me, and the look on his face. Listen, if it wasn't for a little instinct, I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be in business, and I wouldn't have made all the hundreds of millions I've made. So I've learned to trust that. The look on his face said that I was in trouble. I shouldn't have told him to tell them no deal. Not when I was in prison. Not when I was in a jail where I couldn't protect myself. Now, how could they get you but what you had eaten? So we don't have to guess, and I'll post this too. The, in fact, you'll see the communications with me in Jared. I turned around and said to him, and this is, I, I emailed them after the stay. And that letter was that they were going to try to kill me that night. Now, I'm going to read this to you, so we're not in dispute. Now, how do you think that I thought that? Wait a minute. Let's go back to the sixth blood pressure taken that night. You know, the one at late in the morning, maybe one, two o'clock, where I was laying on the floor, my hands blew, and my feet blew. Right, trying to get help. And it was only after I started recovering and other prisoners yelled out. My brush taken then, 100 over 56. My diastolic only dropped in half. I went from a 90 pulse rate to a 54 after I recovered. Right. Lucky guess, huh? So from that on, I was drinking milk and juice from, that was closed containers. And I'm still here to say that. You can explain to me how this happened. And this is why they fought for those records. It's no accident. That's what went on. Now let's think of the lawyer. The one that I was giving this information to. Going to the DEA. Giving him evidence to come in here and, 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 and write this situation. Let's see. Jared, during your visit, I asked you directly, in fact, I insisted that you speak to someone on the DEA on my behalf. You see, I'm in jail. They know I cornered this drug's information. That's where I was in danger. At this time, I've not heard any follow-up you regarding the conversation with the DEA. I need to know who you spoke to and the content of the conversation and a follow-up meeting. All right, this is his response. You asked me to speak with someone at the DEA to convey your concerns for your personal safety. All right. 
So on the day that my blood pressure dropped in half, right, was the same day that this lawyer who came in to see me admits that I said that information to him and told him to go right to the DEA. Well, let's go on. I agreed to call the DEA on your behalf and relate the same and set up in person the meeting that's necessary. Geez, thanks, Jared. I called the DEA multiple times and left messages, at least one or two. Wait a minute. Multiple times, at least one. The fuck does that mean? And thanks for your concern. I received no curls calls back. Wow, no one called you back. Really? That's funny. Once I heard that you had been released, I did not follow up any further. Well, thank you. It was day two. I only had the star for eight more days. I go on. Let's go to question two to Jared. You might recall during the visit, I handed you a letter that indicated it was fear for my life. I asked you to give the letter to Aaron Day. Mr. Day has stated that he did not receive that letter from you. Do you still have that personal letter? You know, the one that said they're going to fucking kill me tonight? Well, let's see. I recalled you handed me a small bundle of assorted papers, one of which you did indicate in handwriting notes expressing your concern for your safety, among other things. Other things? Other than killing me? What do you think? I had a problem with what? The bunk? I never gave everything I had to Mr. Day. I did not retain anything. In your email referred to as a letter, which was causing some confusion. I might have just appeared the notes. Oh, well, I'm going to post this. It was another couple questions. And he answered accordingly. You ready? So my lifeline didn't go to the DEA. Said he called multiple times, maybe once. He's a lawyer, by the way. You see? That's exactly how I knew. And that's exactly the follow-up. How's that for a cover-up? These bastards did try to kill me. And this thing with the cops and the police in Bedford and Plastow, this is covering up for Brian Toomey and Carrie. If they turn around and get them, you get Alex Walker. You get Bill Shaheen. He's only Hillary Clinton's campaign manager in the state. Does this not reach a level of your attention? We can take them all down. Mike Gill, State of Corruption.